So let's talk about the shell. In Unix, the shell is a actually just a user program, so it's not something that needs kernel mode. So if we look over here, we have the kernel. And above this, we have user programs. One user program is shell. Actually, there are many different, uh, so these are kernel mode and user mode. There are many different shells you can use. So for instance, uh, the original shell I used, I used to use was SH. And what I'm using now is, I used for a while, C shell. Not very popular anymore. Um, now I use Bash. Uh, many of you probably on Knuth use uh, Z shell. So there are lots of these different shells that are replaceable. So the shell doesn't have access to any special powers that any other user level program does. So what's the shell do, right? It's a, it's a, it's a command line interface. Or CLI. Okay. And you could do things like uh, it supports redirection. So you're all probably familiar with doing an LS to find the um, directory listing of your current directory. You can also redirect that to a file. You can do, let's say, LS uh, greater than, and that will take the output of LS and put it into a file called output. Or you can do redirection of input. I can do, for instance, mail. mail at pobox.com, less than foo. So that will take the contents of foo and send that as input to the mail program. So that would send me the contents of foo. Uh, what else can I do? I can do piping. So I can actually take the output of one program and feed it in as the input of another program. Uh, for example, let's say I want to find out how many files are in the current directory. I can do ls pipe that, so that's the vertical bar, to word count minus L. And it'll give me a number, you know, print a number like 32, 52, 5, whatever. So how does this actually work? Okay. Well, what the shell does is the shell is running. Right, if the shell, let's do something very simple. Like, let's say we want to just do an LS. Okay, so we're in the shell. We're connected, the, the user has uh, the standard input to be their keyboard and the standard output to be their terminal window. And we want to do an LS. So the user wants to type LS and get back a listing of files. Right? So they are here, they type LS, they might get foo and bar as the files. So what happens? Right. Basically, we're going to need to run another program in user mode called ls. How does the shell do that? Well, it turns out in Unix, there's no, uh, there's no system call that says start up another process with another executable. Instead, those two things are broken down into two different things. So, so there's a system call called fork that will make a new copy of the currently running process. So now we have shell, and I'm gonna just call it shell prime, both running. So this is a result of the fork system call. And then, what does it do? So fork copies the uh, user memory. By user here, I mean the program. So it can make an entire copy of the contents of that. So all globals, the stack, everything else. It copies kernel data structures. Things like which files are open and so on. Okay, so child, so this is clone of its parent.
Okay, they're both running the same program. So this is running the program and this is all running the program. So this gets to be kind of the question of how do you know which is the real one? Right? It's sort of like when Kirk goes through the transporter and makes a copy of him. And now we have two Kirks, which is the real Kirk and which is the, the duplicated Kirk. Kirk. And the answer is that fork returns zero to the parent. I'm sorry, the returns a zero to the child and returns the child's process ID to the parent. Okay. So that way they can act differently. Basically, the shell can do a fork and then look and say, oh, did I get back a, a, a zero? Then I must be the clone, the new one. Did I get back a non-zero? Then I must be the parent. And that way they can check that value and do different things. We'll see in a moment how we can use this to implement the actual running LS. Okay? Actually, we want to do two things. We want to run LS and then we want to turn back to the shell. Both of those are important things. All right, so let's look at what's going to happen, how the shell can actually run the ls command. So we've got the shell up here. Okay. And the shell's life cycle is going to kind of go kind of to the right. So shell is going to execute fork. Okay. When the shell executes fork, first the shell is going to continue on. Okay, but there's now going to be a duplicate here. All right, so on this on this path, fork returned zero, and on this path, fork returned the child's PID. Okay, so let's look at the Let's look at the uh, shell's approach now. What's the shell going to do? The shell is going to do a big wait. It's going to basically say, hey, I want to wait for this child. Okay, so wait until it's done. So it'll just sit there, stopped, waiting until the child finishes. So what's the child going to do now? The child is going to do an exec. Exec says, I am a process replace me, so take over this process with another executable. So in this case, it's going to be execing the ls command. So some slash bin slash ls command. So that is going to be what starts executing. So ls is going to start executing. It inherits the same standard output as the shell had, right? Just to be clear, so in Unix, standard in is file descriptor 0, standard out is file descriptor 1, and standard error is file descriptor 2. And we differentiate between standard output and standard error so that you can redirect into a file, let's say, or pipe something to somewhere else and have the standard output go there. But if you have an error, the error can actually print to your terminal. So if you're doing redirection, often standard output will get redirected, but standard error, standard error will, still, will still go to your terminal. All right, so we do the bin ls. And then part of what the ls does, so if we look, there's going to be a bunch of system calls here right, that get executed by the ls command. It's going to be going, looking in directories, doing stuff like that, doing output. But eventually, it's going to exit, because that is what all programs do, eventually. And so when this exit happens, the wait will now complete, and this will go on. Okay. So the shell can now print another prompt, because it knows that the ls command has finished. So uh, a couple questions, I guess, happen. One, so if we go kind of in this order, shell, we fork, the shell then does a wait, and then the child process does an exec and then an exit. That's fine. After the exit happens, then the wait will go on. But what happens if 
let's say the shell does a fork, and then before it has a chance to do the weight, the other process goes ahead and does the exec, does the LS, does the exit before the weight even happens. So what if the exit happens first? Does this all work? And the answer is yes, we're going to look at the machinery for how that happens. But basically, you can do a weight not only on processes that are going to exit in the future, but also do a weight on processes that have exited in the past. And what if we wanted to do something like So we're at our prompt and we do uh, a ls ampersand, right? Which means run in the background. So I'm going to do something in the background. What would the difference on this diagram be? Well, there'd really be just one difference. And that is we would get rid of the weight. That is the shell would fork, have the child process go ahead and do its ls, and not wait, just go ahead and print out its command prompt. Now, is it possible the command prompt and the output of the LS would be all on top of each other? Yeah, that's the sort of thing that happens. If, if, if you have two processes running, one is trying to run right, right to the standard output, and here this one is also running to standard output. So that, that can happen. Now let's go ahead and, and look at how we might support redirection. So let's say we want to do LS into some output file. Well, we would do everything in the shell part the same. So we're still going to do a wait because it's not running in the background. We do our fork, and then we've got to do a couple things. We've got to basically change standard output. So we don't want standard output to be to the terminal anymore. So we are going to close standard output. All right, so once we've closed file descriptor one, we can now go ahead and open. Our output file. We've got to put the appropriate parameters to say that it's writable. And this takes advantage of the fact that file descriptors are assigned in ascending order. So based on whatever is the next open one. So in this case, we know zero is in use. One is not in use because we just closed it. So therefore, when we open, we'll be opening to that file descriptor. At this point now, we can go ahead and exec ls and now when ls is running it as it always does writes its output to file descriptor one to the standard output but that is now going to not be going to the terminal it's going to be going to this file and eventually that'll exit when we return back to the shell file descriptor one hasn't changed right in the shell we never change file descriptor one, so it's going to just continue writing to the terminal. All right, now let's look at how we're going to implement a pipeline, right? Where a pipeline is going to be something like we'll do, let's say, our one ls pipe to word count minus l. Okay, so we're trying to implement that in the shell. So we have the shell. It's running. We can't do a fork yet. Right? We need to set up some sort of a mechanism for ls to talk to word count. And we're going to take advantage of a pipes in the kernel. So pipes in the kernel allow you to set up a situation where you write into this file descriptor and whatever you write in there comes out in this file descriptor. So we write into here and we read the same thing from here. So what's right in this side comes out on this side. It's like a, I don't know, a wormhole for black holes or something, right? Between different parts of the galaxy. So the shell is going to need to go ahead and set up a pipe between the output of LS and the input of word count so that the output of LS can write into here, sorry, LS can write into this file descriptor 
and then when word count reads, it'll be reading from that output. So the shell is going to go ahead and do a pipe, which creates these two file descriptors. It'll create a write file descriptor and it'll create a read file descriptor. And it does this before the fork because it's important that both uh, the ls and the word count process inherit these file descriptors. So now it can go ahead and do a fork, right? And this fork is going to then start off a new process. So we'll make this process be the ls process. And then it goes ahead and forks again. And that's going to create uh, another process. So that will create, let's say, the word count process here. Okay. So what's the fork, what's the ls process going to do? Well, the ls process needs to make sure that its standard output is not the terminal anymore, but is this write descriptor. Okay. So it's going to close. One, okay, so that the standard output is no longer going to the terminal. And then it's going to close the pipe read file descriptor. Right, because it doesn't need the read side at all. And then it's going to duplicate into one the pipe write file descriptor. So this duplicate command says take an, a, a file descriptor you already have and just copy it, make a duplicate into the designated file descriptor. Okay. And finally, it's going to exec. LS. So while the ls is running, all the output that it does is going to go to, to, to one, but one is going to be the pipe write file descriptor. So it's going to be going in here, waiting for someone on the other side to be reading. Who's going to be on that other side listening is going to be the word count. So what's word count going to do? Well, it's going to kind of do something similar. It's going to close zero instead of closing one. Right? We close zero because it doesn't want to read from the keyboard. Then it's going to close the pipe write file descriptor. And now, again, it's going to do a dupe into zero. The pipe read file descriptor. And finally, it's going to exec word count minus L, roughly. It's going to exec the word count program and pass it the minus L parameter. Okay, So this is how the pipe is going to work. The shell has to create two processes, one to do the first part of the pipe and another to do the second part of the pipe.